yeah, so I made up a fancy title, Enhancing Economic Stability by Building Financial Resilience. Um, Moses approached me about presenting on this topic because in 2016, I had written a Sayre Farmer Rancher grant, um, which if, if you're not familiar with Sayre, it's the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, and it's funded through USDA. But um, they give out these nice little Sayre Farmer Rancher grants where farmers um, can partner up with other farms or go at it alone and write a little grant and then get some money to do some work. And so um, back in 2016, when Matt and I had kind of just started going down this path of entrepreneurship, um, neither of us really were business people and we really needed to find our people and find folks that were going to help us out. And I thought it was a good chance to um, bring some of my friends together that were also just starting businesses and we could learn together. And so I'm going to start with that. And then we'll just kind of go into talking about money and, you know, where we got our money, maybe um, some other options to get money. Because when you get, when you go into a food business, um, it's not like a slow growth, like maybe some sort of internet based or service based business. I mean, when you go into manufacturing, you go from zero up to I need a bunch of money for a facility. And then you outgrow that facility and you need a bunch more money. It's this like, it's a step process. Um, it's not a slow growth process where you can really make some money, reinvest it, make some money, reinvest it, and slowly grow your business. You grow these food businesses or manufacturing businesses in these kind of giant leaps and bounds. And it makes the economics um, or the financials behind it just a little bit more complicated. And so I'll just, I'm, I'm always really open about our finances. I'm willing to talk to anyone about where we got our money, how we got our money, um, and whether it's working or not. So um, on that, I will start with um, kind of, I'll just give you a quick introduction about who I am and definitely who I'm not. And I feel like um, the who I'm not matters as much as the who I am. So um, I'm, I'm a born and raised Wisconsin girl, um, originally from, from way up north and, and made my way down to the Driftless area. Um, my background is soil science and agroecology. I have a couple degrees there. Um, and I worked a long, I've worked and continue to work in conservation. So I, I worked for about 10, 10 years with USDA NRCS as a soil conservationist, um, administering different cost share programs, things like that. Um, I worked for a couple years with the Ag Research Service out in Beltsville, Maryland at the National Ag Research Farm. Um, and there I did uh, research. I was a research technician on um, kind of the early days of the no-till and the um, no-till organic roller crimper. So we worked with Rodale Institute and the University of Delaware out there. So I that was back in 2010 that we started working on that. So that was kind of an interesting, interesting time to be kind of newer in that whole roller crimper world. Um, then actually my husband and I moved to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. He was working with the State Department and I took a job um, helping to run a, a nonprofit that was an education facility in um, Lilongwe, Malawi on sustainable agriculture. So that's kind of where I got a little bit more financial, um, I would say experience. Uh, anyone who's worked in the nonprofit world knows that it's quite the rat race and, and the international nonprofit world is no different. And so getting money, writing grants, um, funding what we were doing and figuring out how to run an 80 acre farm to make some money and pay some employees. We had about 30 employees that we were trying to keep on staff. So that was a really good, um, way to learn a lot in, in a couple years. And, um, and I think I was able to take some of that back to our business. And then finally I got, uh, to be honest, like uh, international development was not for me. And so um, I took a job back with NRCS in Wisconsin. And then just recently about four years ago, I took a job with Dane County Land Conservation. And so I went from federal conservation work into county um, conservation work. And it's, it's very similar, but I kind of have access to a little bit different 
pots of money. And I'll, I'll talk about some of that at the end, because that's all, all part of what's available to us as farmers. Um, so what I'm not is a financial advisor. I am not a trained accountant. I am not, um, I don't have my MBA. I don't have any of that stuff. What I have is like 15 years of work. And then over the past five years, we've built up this food business um, pretty much from, from nothing. We didn't buy a business or anything like that. And so we've had to learn, learn a lot. I think we we formed our LLC in 2016. Um, and we started selling our first products in early 2017. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit more, but I just, you know, I'm not like giving financial advice. I'm just going to kind of tell you our story and what we did and what has worked and what has helped us get to where we're at. Um, and it has not all been, um, you know, we're a little scrappy, but it's definitely not all that. Um, so, you know, our company, our vision is that we believe we do everything we can as local as humanly possible. I mean, um, we, you know, box suppliers, anyone printing our labels, nothing comes from really out of state. Um, our label guy, you know, he's a newer guy. He comes down the road. He prints all of our labels for us. Um, we don't do anything bulk online. We really try to keep everything super local. Um, and we believe that, you know, cider is this beverage that is actually local, which is very different than a lot of our quote unquote local beers and, um, and other drinks. I mean, if only I could get all my ingredients shipped to the loading dock and have, you know, a recipe like that's just not how we work. We go out and we pick apples and we press them and we make them into cider and everything comes from our community. It comes from our friends and, and things like that. So we really, we really believe in what we do. We believe that we can influence our local food economy. Um, in a really positive way. And, um, and we, we've really been able to over the past several years. Um, but anyway, that's kind of who we are, just to give you our background and what we believe in. And then also, you know, when it comes to money, where we spend our money, um, we're very deliberate about how we spend our money and where we spend our money. Um, and then why we do it is Matt and I are you know, we're really passionate about our community. We live, um, we just, we actually, we were living in Barneveld, which is a, a very small town um, in Iowa County. And we just bought a new farm. We closed two weeks ago in Dane County, um, just south of Mount Horeb. And um, we're really excited to be even closer to our, our brick and mortar, which is um, brick cider in, in Mount Horeb. And then, um, have our kids in the school district and just really kind of embrace all of our friends and the people have, who have supported us here. And, and we plan on doing a lot of really great things with the farm that we bought. And so, um, and I'm going to go into how we bought it because that's not easy either. I'm not going to pretend like, um, like buying a farm is something that's super easy. So, um, and those are my two cute little kiddos, um, which is another reason why we do all this, just trying to, trying to do good by our kids and, make them proud of us. So, all right. So I was asked to do this presentation to focus on this Sarah Farmer Rancher grant that we did back in 2016. Um, so again, Sarah Farmer Rancher grants are these nice little grants. I think they're up to $30,000 $30, if you're pairing up with um, other farms or organizers. And you write these grants. They're not that hard to write. They're a really good introduction grant. And I'm going to go into some other grants that we've utilized that are definitely not for beginners. Um, so this one, this one is a great one to kind of get your, um, get your boots a little bit muddy in the grant world. So uh, Sarah, again, is Sustainable Egg Research and Education. It's a USDA uh, funded program. They run it out of the University of Minnesota and really great people run the program. I've been working with them for years. Um, I've gotten some other SARE grants for some um, work in my, in my day job with the county as well. And so it's a, it's a really good, um, it's a really good program and, and they just want to do good stuff and give firms money. So it's great. Um, so what we did is, uh, 
back in like, I don't know, maybe 2006 or something, I was working up in Green Bay and there was this really cool group of fa dairy farmers that had, you know, not nothing formal, but had formed this collaboration where they were going to get together. And I think it was monthly or bi-monthly and open their books to one another and, and really talk to each other and be, be honest and truthful and give each other feedback on things that they were doing in their operation and then helping to sort out what everyone else was doing, give advice, say, Hey, I tried this or I did this and, and just be a really collaborative group of farmers and really um, uh, trust in one another to, to give good advice and be truthful and open about what's working and what's not. And I was always really um, impressed by that group. Um, Rick Adamski, if ever, if anyone knows Rick was part of that. And um, when we wrote this grant, I had Rick write a letter of recommendation for it because I knew that he had found that to be a really useful thing that he started up in that area. Um, so we built off of that and I got a group of seven farms together, um, all pretty beginning farmers. Some, um, some maybe had been farming somewhere else, but starting their own operation, things like that. And they're farms that we all know and love now. So I've, uh, we started with um, uh, Lauren Rudersdorf from Raleigh's Hillside Farm, which some of you probably know. We've got Beth Wright from Winterfell Acres, Robbie Abaromia from Adams to Apples, and then um, John and Hallie Webking from um, Meadowlark Organics. And um, what's really neat is we're, we're all really good friends. Rami is like, I can see his house from my new house. We're neighbors. Um, Rami and I still work together a lot. He custom presses all of our apples for us. Um, I source food from both Beth and, and Lauren for my restaurant. And of course, Metal Arc Organics is the only flour um, that we use. All of our bread buns, pizza crusts, everything is 100% um, locally grown um, and milled flour from, from John and Hallie. And like our kids go to school together. I mean, this is like, we're like a real, we're like a real live little community. Um, Rami's daughter is, is a dishwasher and I'm sure she'll, she'll be a, she'll be a bartender before we know it at Bricks. It's, um, we keep things really close and, and that way we're, what I like about that is we're not just friends and friendly, but we're also very interdependent in these small rural communities. And I think it's, um, really important that all of us, and we all live in these small communities for the most part, um, understand and respect that interdependence. And I think if more people, especially, I think, you know, obviously I know food and I know farming. So people in food and farming, if they recognized, if we could recognize that interdependence more and we could convince our restaurant owners that um, if they can just source things more locally, that money is going to come back around. I think that's, you know, like a hairdresser comes into my restaurant and maybe that next week I turn around and I spend money to get a haircut. I mean, it's really simple math. Like this is not a complicated system. And I think, um, we can all do better at demanding that our local institutions support things more locally, um, asking when you go out to eat, like, hey, where does your burger come from? And if they don't know, maybe, um, you know, make a little stink about it and, and maybe drop a name of someone you know that they could get their burger from, like, this isn't a big deal. Um, but I really just want to emphasize, like, how just a small business, like we did, you know, just over half a million in sales last year. But of that, I would guess probably somewhere and we just did an analysis. I think it was about 85% of the money that we spent was um, to either directly to farms, to local producers and manufacturers, or to, I would call them more regional. So like, there's a couple of things we source from Minnesota and Iowa, but for the most part, I mean, it's like, it's an incredible amount of money that goes right back into the community. And in my head, eventually turns around and comes back into our business. And so um, I just want to emphasize that before I even get into this, into this grant that we did a few years back and the importance of collaboration and friendship and trust and understanding that these things all come back to us. Um, 
so poor Teddy, that's my, he's now almost six, but um, I thought anyone talking about money, balance sheets, to, you know, cash flows, like that's how we all feel. We all kind of want to curl up in a ball in the corner um, and, and cry and maybe have snot running out of our nose a little bit because it's just, you know, I'm sure all of us, I didn't get into, um, you know, we didn't buy a farm or start a food, start this cool business, this farm to table restaurant and cidery, um, you know, to do balance sheets and cash flows and taxes and all that stuff. So it's a little bit painful, but it's really important. And I've always been one where I'm willing to pass things off to professionals and to find the right resources, but I do want to understand it myself first. And so a good example of that is you know, this group that we started in 2016 and went into 2017, what we did is we met seven times with, um, actually we met eight times, but seven times with different, um, different professionals and had really just close knit, nice conversations about all of these things. And so the, you know, the other thing that's neat about this is none of, we didn't pay for any of these resources. So um, it's really it's replicable. Like if you've got a group of people that you trust and are in a, in a similar, but not, it doesn't have to be the same type of business. And I'll go, you know, we had a a kind of a more large scale grain farm, a couple CSA farms, apple grower. Then we had Vanessa Harold from make time farm, which she does these really neat little retreats out at her farm. Um, Really a, a whole bunch of different people got together with different business models and And we still could work together and help each other out. So um, I immediately paired up with the infamous or famous infamous Paul Dittman from Compure Financial. At the time, it was still Badgerland Financial. Um, So he was a partner in the grant. um, And he, you know, day one, we just jumped into it. And everyone, we went over how to get your balance sheet up to date, how to keep it up to date. And then we all came to the next session with an up-to-date balance sheet. And it's like, you know, we had to agree that we were all going to do a little bit of work, but I think um, it forced, you know, we, we could also help hold each other a little bit accountable. And so we did that. And then that went into cash flow analysis. And we all know that cash flows on farms are a little bit more complicated um, as our cash flows on any sort of um manufacturing. So we're, we're a manufacturer. We are uh, technically a winery. Um, cash flow is really interesting because uh, in farming, right, you get, you may get a glut of cash at one point of the year, and then you have kind of this boom and bust where um, for us, you know, we, we have to spend a lot of money in the fall. We need to pick all the apples, press all the apples. And at that point, it's not a quick turnaround to an actual, um, you know, to making the money back, we have to do everything in about a 12 week period. And then the rest of the year is when we sell that product, either in the tap room, or um, we distribute uh, to, you know, 30 or 40 different stores around around the area. And so understanding those cash flows, and when you might need, and I think it's really important, but when you might need an influx of money from somewhere else, just to carry you through. And, um, and I also, I will, you know, I'll be the first to, to say like, everyone has different risk levels and risk management risk, of, you know, some people are more risk averse than others, as far as um, loans and taking out, taking out loans to expand businesses. I mean, I've, I've seen the lean model for farming. I respect that. It's just not the way that, that a manufacturer can think. We can't think, like I said at the beginning, in this super small growth that, in my opinion, and and I know enough um, food manufacturers around, it's just not, unless you're so small scale that you're never going to really need a facility, um, it's, you kind of, it's jumps and starts, um, jumps and stops and starts. And so cash flow is really important in understanding when, when, when to bring in some of that outside money just to get you through knowing that you're going to recoup that money later on and then which money which money to get, um, you know, a big thing we learned is the right money from the right source at the right time. And I think if everyone can remember that right money, right source, right time, it can really help out when you're trying to make those decisions on when you take out a loan, when you don't, um, and how that money is spent and how that affects your balance sheet. 
And what I think is really nice about keeping an up-to-date balance sheet is that it makes you, at least for me, it makes me feel really good at the end of the year because for the most part, as long as you're paying off those loans and you don't have incredibly depreciable assets, you start to look really good. You may not have a bunch of money in your pocket and you might not be you know, going on vacation twice a year to who knows where, but like when you go to take out that bigger loan in a few years to expand your business, you can do it because you've built this equity and you've, and you've, um, you've built a business that's worth something. And so keeping that balance sheet up to date at least once a year, um, it's a little boost of confidence for me as well. Um, and then when we went to buy our farm, um, the fact that, you know, we had built all this equity over the past few years was what allowed us to do that. Um, so Paul Dittman helped with balance sheets and cash flow. And then what we did is we actually, this is where I did spend a little money as I hired a tax consultant and I used the grant money, but I think you could probably find someone to do this um, without payment as well if you needed to, but also everyone deserves to get paid for their expertise. So I'm all about paying people to do things um, and not always kind of going with the free version of everything. There's a reason people are good at their jobs and, and those people should, should get paid um, for their expertise. So we did hire a tax consultant to come in. Um, and this was right around tax time. I want to say it was like February or something. And so we all just sat around a table and went over, um, went over a schedule F. And I thought that was really useful. It, it almost, you know, it can almost double as your balance sheet in some ways. It really helps fill in gaps on your balance sheet at the end of the year. Um, but we hired someone and we spent several hours going around and making sure we really understood that schedule F top to bottom. And then um, we did go a little bit into, I think it was like a schedule C for folks that needed that. Um, but she was really great, explained everything. Um, we could ask questions and then there was, you know, some room for follow up with her as well if people had questions afterwards. Because some of us were hiring out our taxes and some of us were doing the taxes ourselves. So it, it kind of depended on where you were there. Um, we also paid for, I believe I paid for the QuickBooks session. And that was because most of us are using QuickBooks at this point. Um, there is other, I wish there was other, but whatever, love-hate relationship with QuickBooks. I'm sure we all feel that way. Um, and that's a little tougher. That would be one that I don't know that a group setting was necessarily the way to learn QuickBooks. I feel like it's not my language either. I'll be the first to admit that. I struggle with it. Um, I'm, I'm still the accountant at Bricks at some point in the very near future. I'd like to hand more and more of that off. But like I said before, I really like to understand things before I hand them off to someone else because I like to go in there and look at reporting and things like that. Um, QuickBooks is one that I think you almost just got to get in it and start messing things up. I mean, I spend more time probably fixing my mistakes than actually entering things into QuickBooks. It's embarrassing, but I'll admit it. I'm not great. I'm not a great accountant. Um, but, um, I do go back and, and I work with my accountant that, um, helps me fix everything and we get it to get it to work by the end of the year. Um, the other, uh, the next meeting we had was, was I just called it investments, but, um, we had Tara Johnson from the food and finance Institute come in and talk to the group about capital investment. And then she is. So she, if you guys don't know Tara Johnson, um, she has a really great podcast called Edible Alpha. Um, if anyone, anyone in the food industry, I really recommend her podcast. Um, she's an incredibly knowledgeable woman. She's run cheese companies in the past. Um, she built a company from the ground up called Tara's Way, which was taking um, waste organic whey from a cheese producing facility. Um, and then manufacturing that into a whey protein product that is still one of the top um, organic whey products on, on the market, which secrets out, I don't, I don't, I don't use it, but I've heard really great things. And so she built this, this company up in Reedsburg, Wisconsin, which is a small town, not an easy thing to do. She, she is really talented at um, 
at getting people to invest in businesses. Because like I said, some of these companies, you need, you need a pretty solid investment um, to even get going, get going in a manufacturing setting. And so Tara's great. Again, um, she, she's a food and finance Institute at the university of Wisconsin and her podcast is edible alpha. And I'll, I'll plug her all day. She's been our business consultant from the, from the beginning. Um, we probably first met with her in 2016. Um, the best thing about Tara is that she is, um, she is not a cheerleader and we all need cheerleaders in our life, but even more than that, we need, um, we kind of need dream crushers. I think uh, anyone, anyone starting a business, you need, you need your family cheering you on on one shoulder, and then you need some sort of small animal that um, dream crushes you over and over again um, to make sure that you, you continually reevaluate your ideas and make sure that what you're doing makes sense and that you're not, you're not going the wrong direction. So having those sounding boards and going to these groups, you know, like I feel like I can, well, cause you know, Hallie's one of my best friends. I can call Hallie when I have a random question about something and, and I know I'm going to get good advice or, or if she doesn't have it, we'll, we'll figure it out together kind of thing. And so just having those people that you really trust that are not always going to tell you, yes, yes, yes. Um, I think it's really important to have people that tell you what's up. Um, so another another group session we did was on capital analysis and and basically we took two different two different of the group members were doing building projects at the time or had plans for building projects i think it was uh one of them was a pack shed and just going through and like just running a rate of uh a return on investment calculation and these are like apps you can get on your phone it is not it's not super complicated but what i think more often than not when I run a return on investment, um, it's a, it turns out to be a no brainer where maybe like this, you know, Oh, do I buy another display freezer or do I buy this piece of equipment or blah, blah, blah. And it, you know, it keeps you up at night where if you would just spend the five minutes, even on the back of an envelope, whatever, and just run those numbers quick, you might save yourself a whole bunch of sleep. I mean, I know when we looked at getting and, you know, this COVID stuff, like, of course, we had to do a pivot, blah, blah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to dive into that too much. But the point was, when I looked at kind of changing our tap room around and investing in some equipment, I, you know, we sat down and did some return on investments on some equipment. And it was like a no brainer, where if I hadn't done that, maybe I would have hemmed and hawed and waited another month. And that's all, you know, that's potential profit that we would have lost. And, um, and instead, we were able to really capitalize on, on, you know, there's some silver linings in all this, let's just be honest, so capitalize on some of that. And so I really encourage people to like, if you can do it, and if it's going to save you some sweat and sleepless nights on should I or shouldn't I invest in this new vehicle or invest in um, whatever it is that you need for your farm, I really encourage you to like, how long is it really going to take you? to um, to make up that cash, especially um, equipment. And I think that's something where we often are nervous about purchasing new equipment. But when you look at um, what it costs in human labor to do a lot of this stuff, boy, it, it can be a real quick return on investment. So I really encourage people to just learn how to do that. Be a real, be realistic with your numbers though. I mean, you know, don't make it too rosy. Maybe be, you know, be a little bit conservative um, and, and just, you know, utilize those resources. And then finally, we, um, we worked with SCORE, which I should know what SCORE stands for, but it's a bunch of retired entrepreneurs and business owners and they go around and they just help other business owners out. And so, um, we had someone from SCORE who was really knowledgeable in just payroll and taxes and payroll, you know, all the workman's comp, all of that stuff, um, sit down with us and just go over just kind of the nuts and bolts of like, what does it mean to have employees? Um, how, do you, how do you make sure that you're compensating them appropriately? And then also what I learned from that 
is what having an employee actually costs you. And that's really important because you might say, oh, I can afford to pay, you know, 20 bucks an hour, but you need to understand that like you can pay that. Um, and that's, and if you can, gosh, I hope I, I'm, we really, we, we try to pay employees well, but you know, I'd love to pay everyone 20 bucks an hour. Um, but really there's all these associated costs behind that. And you need to be really careful that when you do start to add employees, that you understand, um, what your workman's comp is going to be, that you're responsible for half of the, um, payroll taxes, which get expensive, fast people. I'm telling you, my payroll tax bill every month is um, in the in the thousands for sure, several several thousands. And I only have fourteen employees, and three are full time. And so, um, yes, several thousand dollars every month goes to federal payroll taxes, and that is not something um, that is really uh, I mean, your employee pays for half of it, but it's, it's still a lot. I'm just putting it out there. Um, it's stuff like that, that I wish more people would have told me when I was writing up my business plan at the beginning, because it's a lot of money. Okay. So those were our group meetings. Poor Teddy looks miserable. Um, we weren't all that miserable. We often shared pretty good food and snacks and, and we went around to everybody's different place. And so we got to see everyone's farms and made it a little bit fun. Um, so resources, again, I'm going to go over these again, because I think it's really important that everyone understands what resources are out there. I think that um, some of these might be Wisconsin specific, but probably not, to be honest with you, it might come under a different name in a different, um, in a different state or region. But um, so small business development center, I would think most states have a small business development center, you know, SBDC is what we call it here. That was definitely our first our first contact when we wanted to start a was to start a business was we contacted SBDC and we met with an advisor and she um, was the one that initially introduced us to our lawyer, which another really fun resource everyone needs is a good lawyer. In my opinion, I love our lawyer. Um, finding a lawyer that specializes in something you're doing is really important. I can't tell you, yes, they're expensive, but a good one is worth every penny and more um, because what they can save you in time and headache is absolutely worth it. And, and when you start a business, um, you need every, you need to save, I'm, I'm telling you this, you need to save every minute you possibly can because you will kill yourself um, trying to do everything always your, like by yourself. Like I just, Time is my most precious commodity. Um, it, it has been for the past five years and it will continue to be. Um, it's, it's what I don't have. And so I really encourage people to find their people and the people they can trust and, and lean into them and use them because they're there to help and they want to help. Um, so Small Business Development Center, can't say enough about them. They really pushed us um, she introduced us to Tara Johnson and then also to our lawyer, Jeff Glazer, who is, um, he works at the university, but he also um, has a private private firm that him and his wife run and they are just, they're wonderful. And I, I'm going to say it, I love my lawyer and I love my banker too. Um, the other resource, again, every state is going to have this, but UW Extension is actually, was really helpful when we went to write our business plan. And then anyone who's written a business plan, you also have to write a pro forma. And that can be really daunting. If anyone wants to see an example of a pro forma, shoot me an email. I am more than happy to, to share ours. It's a beast of a spreadsheet. Um, I mentioned it before, the Food and Finance Institute, that's Tara Johnson. She also helped us find the right extension agent to help us write that pro forma so we could get the bank loan. Bankers, Paul Dittman's my banker. He's our lender for Brick Cider. He's the lender on my farm. Um, I absolutely trust him. He trusts us. It's a really, really great relationship. And I could go on and on about how good it is to have a good relationship with a banker and how awful it can be when you don't have a good relationship with your banker. Um, I work with enough farmers in my day job where, oh my gosh, these bankers drive me crazy. So if you have a good one, hold on tight because they're great. Um, I mentioned it, but SCORE is something that's in Wisconsin. Again, maybe um, it's a bunch of retired entrepreneurs. Maybe maybe in other states they have them too. 
um, your peers, whether it's people that you're really tight with, or maybe just um, people on social media that you follow. I mean, I randomly ask questions on Instagram to businesses that I don't know all the time. I am not scared to send someone a message. Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't. But like when we were looking for a pizza oven, right? I was like, oh, how do I know? I just found some business that had the same one and sent them an Instagram message. Like now we're, you know, pretend friends on the Instagram. That's great. And then finally, friends, this is, um, if you guys don't know Hallie, this is Hallie Wepking from Metal Lark Organics. Um, like I said, our kids are the same age. We've been friends for years. What I would do without the Wepkings. I, we, we heavily rely on each other for just not even all business, but like emotional mom support too. I mean, having little itty bitty kids at home and trying to start a business is really tough. And so knowing that there's someone else who's kind of struggling along with you is always really important. So uh, thanks to, to Hallie and John. So some quick outcomes. I have, I'm really bad at taking pictures. So I just, um, this is a, a crafting group that gets together at Bricks. But the point here is that it's a group of people that get together and share resources. Um, we're sharing beads and yarn and things, but you can share whatever you want to share. I just think it's important to know that to find some people that are in your in your community that you can rely on and um, to be cheesy, cross pollinate with, you know, just just find your people, and they might not be, you know, in the exact business as you, and maybe that's better because you don't feel like you're in competition with them, but just. Um, finding your people is really important. So setting some priorities. If you do have a group, like, you know, it doesn't even have to be economics. Maybe you have a different priority. Maybe you get a group together that's really focused on soil health or, or cover crops, or you feel like in your locale, there's not a good grazing um, resource group. And maybe that's what you do. There's all these different things you can do. Um, you know, identify the resources that are available to you and, and build and have confidence. Like, you know, what we're doing is really hard as business owners and as entrepreneurs and as moms and all and makers and, and community organizers. And we're, we're all these different things and we're wearing all these different hats. But it's important to be confident in, in the hat that you're wearing and, and know that what you're doing is the right thing and, and persevere, but also like check yourself. And, you know, it's not all about confidence. You don't want to be an asshole either. So, um Community, I won't, I won't stress community anymore. I mean, it's, it's the number one thing that keeps our business alive and keeps me sane. I love partnerships. I think anytime you can utilize someone else's um, expertise and resources and they can, they can gain something from you, obviously that's the best way to go. Um, you know, we partner with other businesses in the community literally all the time. Um, trust is important. Find people you can trust. And then what I think is great about these groups, and, and it's any group, and we're probably all a part of these groups without even thinking about them as being kind of more formal, but you can always make them a little bit more like, hey, guys, let's let's bring in this resource that we all need. It's all replicable, right? Like any of us can do this in our community with our friends, with our peers. Um, what I would say is to for longevity, you do need some sort of leader or a few people who are going to kind of take the helm and organize things. Um, if you want it to keep going, I'd say stability. Um, I'm in a couple other like, and again, random groups like a women's outdoor group and we meet monthly and sometimes there's five of us and sometimes there's two of us. But the point is, is that we meet monthly. Um, and then reorganize is needed. I always put that. I mean, there's no reason to stay stagnant. So keep moving, uh, keep moving forward, bring in new people, maybe some people shut out and that's okay too. Um, so this is one of my favorite pictures. This was Moses conference in lacrosse, of course, uh, exactly two years ago, it came up, I threw this picture in this morning, because it came up on my Instagram memories. But um, so that's three of us moms at, at Moses. And I think our babies range from like, three weeks to six weeks old in that picture. And it was just such a fun weekend, even though we hardly got to hang out because we had these little babies around. But it was it was really empowering and fun to be able to, to hang out with my fellow moms at Moses and I miss Moses. So um, I'm just gonna reiterate, I think this is important. This came out of my, my Sarah report is 
as small communities continue to lose strength in their social fabric, which we've all seen in these small communities as businesses go out, main streets um, shutter. Collectives of small businesses supporting one another are going to really become vital to preserving their resiliency. And I really think that um, the more we can do together, you know, rising tide raises all the ships. I am, I am a firm believer that um, supporting even another restaurant in town, you know, I'm constantly reposting posts from other restaurants in town, which seems really counterintuitive, but I think the more my town thrives, the more I'm going to thrive. And so I want everyone to do well. And I, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, and I think it's helped us because I think when customers see that you, you want everyone to do well, they believe in you more and they're going to support you and they're going to support um, everyone else that you do too. So, all right. So I'm going to quick go through our money story. I know I talk a lot. I'm sorry. And I want to leave plenty of time for questions. If there are any, I can't even tell if anyone's out there. I mean, maybe no one's listening to me right now, which is really awkward and strange. Um, so our money story, I put BC, which is before COVID. And then I have a, have an AC just after, even though we're not quite there yet. So um, these pictures I have, like, how did we go from this, like, homebrew cider making, you know, everything in carboys and on that little wooden press to like a product that we commercially sell? Um, and how do we make that jump? And so the first thing we got, which it seems small and crazy, but we got this little buy local buy Wisconsin grant from the state. Um, and what it did, it helped us. It helped us pay um, pay our employees and get our product to market. So it was just twenty four thousand dollars, but it helped us pick apples and get a product made. It was totally imperative to us getting an actual commercial product. And what we did is we rented a we rented space in an existing winery for two years before we opened our own production space. So it helped us, you know, get get a product launched. Then when we were ready to really go for it, open our own space, um, buy equipment, we did, through Compeer Financial, we did what's called an SBA 7A loan, which is a small business association. So it's a federally subsidized or federally backed loan. And what that means is that it takes some of the risk away from the bank. And so it allow banks to make riskier loans to small businesses. I'm not gonna pretend it's easy. You do a lot of work to get these loans. The federal government, like we all know, requires a lot of paperwork. Um, but you you surround yourself like with people like Paul Dittman, Tara Johnson, you've got a good lawyer. You've got this person at UW Extension helping you tighten up that performa and make sure that the when the bank gets it, it's in, it's in the condition it needs to be. You know, $150,000 was our initial, I think it's our only bank loan at this point. Um, and the reason we were able to build out a facility for a, such a small, I mean, $150,000 is a very small amount of money to open. I think we have like a 6,000 foot um, tap room and, and winery space is because we, um, our landlord financed the build out of the space. And so that's another layer to all this is like, is this something you're building on farm? Because then you need the equity to also do a build out, which is not easy. And trust me, we looked at it and we weren't going to find a bank that was going to loan us all the money to build a brand new facility on the farm and give us the working capital we needed to launch it. And so sometimes there's all these things that come into play. And so finding a landlord for us that financed that build out and worked it into the rent. So our rent is really high, but our loan payments are, um, are actually pretty low considering. Um, for us, a game changer and, and whether, whether you're prepared to jump into the world of grants or not was the value added producer grant, the VAPG. It's a USDA grant um, and it's specifically for farmers to add value, help help with working capital to add, add value to agricultural products. It's no joke of a grant. I have this funny picture, which I can't find, but when Matt printed out the grant, once he finished writing it, um, my husband, Matt is, is a good grant writer. He's, we both worked in nonprofit world and grant writing world, but um, he's, he's quite good at it. It was literally a ream of paper. 
and we had to print it and mail it into USDA hard copy. And so it was, I mean, it was like this. I don't know if you guys could, I mean, it was incredible, um, the size of that grant package. Um, it's something to look into if you really are going to kind of make that leap from kind of a small, maybe test kitchen into um, a full-on production facility. And, and what's magical about the value-added producer grant, and it is magical, is that it is working capital. And that's working capital. Is once you start to get into this world of loans and banks, it's like the unicorn that no one can get. I mean, it is so hard to find someone to give you money to exist. They, they will give you money for tanks. They will give you money for a sign to put on the front of your building, but no one's going to give you money to actually run your company and hire people and buy in kind of the little product that isn't, um, isn't a, st a stainless steel tank. Uh, we also took a second mortgage out on our house. We ended up, uh, we paid back everything on that so far, but 30,000, which I feel pretty good about. Um, is that right? Maybe it was, no, it was 50. Damn it. I don't feel as good about that now. Anyway, the point is we did pull the equity out of our house because we didn't have, we don't have money. We're not people who come from money. Um, we, we just don't have access to other, other funds, private family funds. So we, we pulled the equity out of our house and uh, well, We'll see. Hopefully I did pay off the loan when we bought the new farm. So at least I'm, I'm clear on that second mortgage now, but um, I'm not going to pretend like we didn't put a bunch of our, our personal money into this. And then, you know, I mean, you kind of have to be in it to be in it. And then the scrappiness part, I mean, you can be scrappy for so long until you run out of money and then it, and then the scrappiness doesn't get you any, any further, but we really, it was incredible when we opened our doors in when we opened the tap room in January, so two, just over two years ago, I think we had like a thousand bucks left in our checking account. I mean, it was, to, to say I was scared shitless is an understatement. I mean, we were literally a thousand dollars away from like, I don't know what we would have done. And slowly we were able to just get people in the door and, oh, it was nuts. It was nuts. Um, and then just to quickly go over what we've used um, post COVID, because we did, we did shut down um, completely for three months and switched to um, delivering local groceries. So we basically turned into a food co-op. Um, we got a couple of these Wisconsin Economic Development Grants. The, the $2,500 one was the one that kind of anyone could get. And then we did get an innovator grant, which took some effort. And I, I do struggle a little because I, you know, everyone gets mad that, I mean, I, certain people got screwed out of this money. I'm not going to pretend they didn't. Um, but you also did need to, to put in a little bit of work to get some of it. And so, like that two and a half thousand, you actually didn't, you put in your bank, your name and your bank account information, but the innovator grant, I wrote up a little grant for that. And we got it and we got some new display freezers, which was great. Um, we did a PPP loan for 33,000, which was again, great, helped us pay the rent and, um, and groceries are not as profitable as selling booze. Who would have thought, right? And so it did help us um, keep our employees, uh, the ones that needed the money, we made sure to keep employed during all of that. Um, we did end up getting an uh, economic injury disaster loan, which I still have well over 100,000 in the bank on that one. I'm sitting on it because I'm, you know, we use some of it to make some pretty big investments at BRICS, um, but the investments are also, I ran those, those return on investments. And we are going to make the money back on those very quickly. And so I'm not, again, I'm not scared of taking out a loan if I know that I can make the money back. Um, and then the big one that we did this year, um, again, I'm going to I'm going to credit my husband Matt with this, is we did a local food promotion program grant, um, which was big, four hundred twenty-three thousand dollars. However, not all of that comes to us. Um, we are working very closely with. Um, the University of Wisconsin to do an analysis on what a community food hub really looks like if they can be profitable, because that's really, really what we've turned our, our food side of side of the business into the cidery chugs along it makes cider. Um, you know, we distribute cider, it does not, by any means cover the costs of an entire tap room staff, all of that. Um, but the local food promotion program grant, I'd say follow us and, and that one just launched. Um, we hired a local media company called Black Crim Creative, which is um, 
anyone who knows uh, Jana and Jesse Perkins of Vermont Valley Community Farm, they have their own media company. And so they're one of our main partners on this grant as well as U University of Wisconsin-Madison. We have a PhD student working with us on, on analyzing all this local food business stuff. Um, I took a blurry picture of Matt working on his computer because grants, um, things that kind of, you know, have helped us along. Grants are really tedious and take a lot of time. And when you don't get them, it's a bummer. But when you do, it can be a game changer. And so there's all levels of grants, right? There's state and local grants, which might be something like Wisconsin Economic Development or um, maybe your counties. You know, I know Dane County had a few grants available to small businesses, um, depending on the county you're in. There's federal grants. like So we've taken advantage of um, several USDA grants. Sayer grants. Um, and then there's private. And I was just chatting with a, with a farmer friend this morning um, who needs some infrastructure. And she was asking me if I knew of any available grants. And I know one that's open right now that I would really encourage people to look at is the Frontera Farmer Foundation grants. I have, I know several people who were awarded grants last year. It's, um, it's for capital improvements on farms. And I think that, um, that is something that I wish private industry would do more of. I mean, we're never gonna, we're never gonna get to be where we want to be until private industry invests in us. Um, I do believe that. Like we, we do need, um, and it's not investments, handouts. It's like investments. We're investing in an economy. We're investing in our local communities. Um, I don't consider that any sort of handout by any means. We're gonna, we're gonna turn that money over and over again in these communities. Um, quickly, because I've worked with cost share for so long, I'm sure most people are aware of this, but I'll just throw it out there anyway. Um, your local um, land conservation, if you're in Wisconsin, or whether you have soil and water districts, if you're um, like over in Minnesota, or maybe Illinois has that as well. Um, county funds, sometimes there's some cost share available for different things. Um, but I just want to distinguish between cost share and grants, because cost share is often... Um, a few more, while well, they all have strings attached, but there's differences. NRCS doesn't give out grants, they provide cost share and it's cost share for a specific practice. Um, same with Fish and Wildlife Service. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of different cost share out there. And I think for me to try to give advice on it doesn't really work because every county, um, every region is so different. It totally depends on what you're doing. And my main, after doing cost share and working as a, as a conservationist is like, don't farm to the program. I can't tell you how often I get people who come and say, I own this farm, like what can you cost share? That is, please don't do that. What you need to do is come with your vision, what you want, and then find out if there's money to support that. But farming to these programs are saying, oh yeah, I'll do... I'll add cut flowers to my business so that I can get a hoop house. Like, don't, please don't do that. It never works out. Um, really just do what you're going to do. And if the cost share works out, take advantage. And if it doesn't, please don't. That's my advice. Um, and finally, loans. So I said I'd get a little bit more into loans. So there's private loans, obviously, friends, family. You know, sometimes you get loans from people and that can be, that can be a game changer for sure, especially when it comes to that working capital. Um, bank loans. Um, we have a, a new to us 2009 big uh, one ton truck because our old truck, the brakes went out twice. Like I can tell you the loan on that truck that isn't even that big. We spent $20,000 getting ourselves a new truck and trailer. But I sleep better at night knowing that we're not driving something around that's unsafe. That truck can handle the capacity that we're asking it to do. You know, I drive junky old cars, that 11 year old truck is the nicest thing we own. And, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I really encourage, I mean, safety is, safety is obviously important. This is a picture of our new farm, um, just one of the barns. Um, we bought a, it's beautiful 25 acre farm. Um, so not big, but big enough for us and our apples and, and some livestock. But um, I'd encourage people, I know farm ownership is, it's controversial, if nothing else, it's also um, really hard to do. And I understand that. We use the equity, of course, in our previous house, and we had a smaller farm. 
um, to purchase this one. But what, what was critical, and I really want everyone to know this, and, and hopefully when it does come time, if you have the opportunity to purchase your own farm, is utilizing the Farm Service Agency and their beginning farmer loan program. So what that is, is it's a, it's a federally backed loan. So you partner with a bank. I partnered with Compere Financial and Paul Dittman, and they call it a 50-45-5 loan. And basically what it means is, I believe the bank covers 50% of the loan farm service agency, which is USDA, um, covers 45% of the loan, and then it's a 5% down payment. And anyone buying a farm of any size knows that that down payment is, um, if you have to do a traditional loan at 20%, that can be that can be what ends it, you know, a 5% down loan um, is, is much more attainable. And then also, because it's a federally backed loan, the interest rate comes way down. So I think our interest rate ended up being about 2.2%, which is pretty incredible. So I just want people to know that that resource exists. I'm surprised, you know, I'm working with farmers every day. Some people don't know about these farm loans. Um, and it's really critical, and it can make all the difference. And so I just want to point that out. It's called a FSA beginner, beginning farmer loan. Um, so last thoughts I had were just, I don't know. I don't, I guess I kind of, I've been talking a really long time. Oh my gosh. I've been talking for an hour. I'm going to stop talking and let, let some questions come on in. I really liked what you had to say. Um, and you have a way of doing it in a very, you know, conversational way, even though you don't know who you were talking to. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to funnel you some questions that have come in and we have some questions for you. So, okay. And I'm just going to read them to you and then, um, and you can answer them as we go along. Um, I'm scrolling back. I uh, appreciate your thoughts on the community-based farming aspect, the connection between farms and communities. Um, it's so important, but it's not often recognized. So what is Mount Horeb like? And I mean, in Iowa, so many of our communities are basically empty. Um, and it's a really, it's like a ghost town. And so, you know, what are we going to, what's it going to take to get back some of the communities that we've lost? I mean, so I, it's, a, it's yeah. a good topic. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. but You know, I've lived in all sorts of communities all over the Midwest. Um, so Barneveld, the community we just, we just moved from, and it's only, you know, six miles away from here. My kids still go to school there, is there's not much in Barneveld. We were down to one bar. Um, it does have a K through 12 school, which was um, basically the, the life of that community was that school. Um, I do believe that schools can build communities. I've seen it in several in Wisconsin. Um, I think the loss of a school is sometimes the end of a community, to be honest. I've seen that happen in Wisconsin. Um, so I'm a strong, 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 strong supporter of public education and getting kids into public schools, you know, mm -hmm. enroll your kids in the public schools, please, because that's what's going to, that's oftentimes the lifeline to those communities. And, and that's what builds pride and what's, what makes people want to come back and invest um, and live there. I mean, who wants to live in a community without a school? And even though we did leave Barneveld, it was because our business was in Mount Horeb and Mount Horeb is, is very, Mount Horeb's fine, right? It's 7,000 people. Ah. Um, it's a suburb of Madison. It's commutable to Madison. And that's why we can have a business there. I mean, we, if we would have opened a business in Barneveld or in one of the smaller, I, and I, and we did, we looked at it it just would have been a very different business model. It would have been smaller scale and we would have focused more on distribution. Um, yeah. What's nice about being in Mount Horeb is that we can focus on tap room sales because we have enough of a community to support us. But I've lived all over and I, 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 I don't know what to do yeah. about it. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's not a problem easily solved, but it was something that I think resonated with people. So, um, yeah. and, um, so here's another one. <clears throat> How did you go about building your cohort in relationships? Was there a natural fit as it was already established? Or did you search for people around you and businesses that were like you? How did you develop that over time? Um, so some of the folks in our little group, I just knew very well anyway. 
um, like the Web Kings from Metal Lark Organics. We were just friends anyway. And then I did look for, I wanted a diversity of businesses in the group. I didn't want to be all CSAs or all grazing or, or all, you know, and so I did, like, I didn't know Beth, Bethany from Winterfell Acres. I just kind of came out of the blue and asked her. Um, I, you know, I definitely, you know, I wanted some women, women owner, women business owners in the group was important to me. Um, I did want us to be of similar, similar startup size so that there wasn't, you know, you weren't leaving anyone behind and you weren't, and, and people weren't bored. I think my advantage, and I'll, I'll be honest, is that because I work in agriculture in the community, I kind of know everyone who's farming. And so I could go out and find the people that I thought would, would benefit most from the group. Excellent. It's tough, especially if you're new to a community. Uh, um, you you kind of got to get out there. Yeah, yeah. You, you seem to have the, the right kind of personality to draw people to you. I'll tell you. <laughs> I like okay. to talk. <laughs> Your sales of 500,000 in three years, that's pretty impressive. Um, what's your trade area for your products? I mean, is it just local, regional, national? I mean, how, uh, you know, that's pretty impressive. Right. So, yeah, so, um, so that's split, right? So we have our, we have our distribution, which I think last year was 45,000 was distribution sales. So that's not yeah. a majority of our sales are on premise at the, at the cidery sales. And, um, I think our first year was closer to 350,000. Um, and our second year, just over 500. Um, and I think our, our, our distribution sales followed that. I'll be honest with you. I don't make money on distribution. When I, when I, when we bottle up cider, it's really expensive. Uh, we self-distribute to the Madison area and I write it off as advertising. Uh. Um, we could, and we've, and we've talked about, we're at, you're always at this moment where do we make that next step and really push our distribution or do we continue where we're at, push it a little, a little, but no, but don't overrun our capacity in the cidery because at some point we'd need to increase production pretty dramatically. And because we pick all the apples, um, we would also have to relook at the way that we obtain product. And we're not go going to start um, shipping in apples from Washington State. And so we need to decide uh, how that growth is going to look. But that's the breakdown is it is definitely it's about 10 percent comes from distribution. And we're in like 30 to 40 different stores. So uh, this is a related question. That's sort of like the decision points <clears throat> back before you started this business. Um, where did you start trying to figure it out? Um, meaning, did you start with market research? I mean, what did that process look like? Uh, were there benchmarks that you came across that were decision points, like it's a go, no go kind of thing, but what, how did you get started? Think, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So when we first, I mean, oh my gosh, the number of business names and iterations of business plans, I think, I kid you not, I bet Matt, between the two of us, we probably have 15 different business plans on our computers somewhere since like 2014, maybe. Um, when we were living in, in Malawi, Matt took a online course called the business of brewing out of Portland state. And that was, um, that helped him kind of get a grip on we always, we wanted to, we liked making things boozy. We would take fruit and crush it and ferment it out. And that was kind of our thing. Um, you know, avid home brewers, obviously. Um, and so he took that course and that really just kind of helped him at least wrap his head around some of the business stuff. And he was the one who took a majority of the um, writing of the business plan. Cause I was always for the most part, kind of working that other job that just, you know, got us the health insurance and paid the mortgage. And um and now I work that other job and I feel like I work at Bricks full time. So I'm like a little bit over. And that's why I, I really emphasize time because I really, I could use a little bit more time, but that's how it started. And then I will not, I will not um, emphasize enough having that little dream crusher on your shoulder, someone to tell you when your idea isn't going to work. And that was Tara for us. Um, we came to her thinking we were going to start a brewery. 
And she looked at us and she said, there's too many goddamn breweries, pick something else. <laughs> and, and we always had cider in the back of our head too. And we'd always <laughs> made cider. And then we moved to the drift list and like, it was springtime. And it was like, well, duh, there's apples everywhere. Like we don't even need to grow them. There's so many. And so it was just a really easy, it was actually easy for us to pivot right into cider and focus on that. And that's because we had someone telling us that, you know, to not be stupid. Oh, uh, this is a question that's related to a comment you just made a little bit ago about your time and time is love. I've had somebody say that to me. When do you feel you can quit your day job? And, and is that a goal or not? <laughs> that's funny. Everyone asked me that. And, you know, I really, so I'm really good at my job. And I like my job and my job is the reason that I know all the farmers. Um, my job is the reason that we are sourcing, you know, so much of our food locally is because I know everyone and I love working as a grazing specialist. I love working with dairy farmers and I, I don't think I'm going to give it up. I mean, it's not that I, I, Bricks would make more money if I spent 100% of my time focused on it. I can guarantee I could cover it. We could serve. I'm not having any more babies. We could, we could figure out health care. But I like my job. And I think that it's, um, I think I'm really good at it. And so I'm going to keep doing it. But I appreciate that people want me to be able to quit my job. And I want to tell you that I could. I absolutely could. And I'm choosing not to. Ah, uh, that's it. That's a nice explanation of that situation. Um, here's another question. Um, uh, you had a lot of names and organizations that you had on your resource page there. Um, do many of those work throughout the Midwest or only in Iowa? Um, um, I'm not sure that you can answer that very well, um, but you have a, a, a broad list of options available to you. So. Yeah. My advice is find your small business development corporation, small business association, whoever you just need to like make contact with someone and then it'll just snowball out. Okay. Good. Just make a contact. Try not to, you know, just find someone, even if it's a banker extend. I mean, sometimes extension is dead end. Trust me. Like so extension agents can be duds. And if they're not good, find someone else. Yeah. Uh, here's another related question. The SBDC here in Iowa, they're not that knowledgeable about value added types of businesses. Do you run up against that very often in, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like if you, if you make contact with someone and they're not any good, plenty of us aren't good at our jobs. Right. Uh, my advice is just go find someone else. And I even say that you know, once in a while, if you're looking for like farm cost share and you go into your local, your local county office and they're duds, my advice is maybe go to a neighboring county and see if you can't kind of stoke the fire a little bit and push someone in, into helping you. <laughs> cool. We need more of you. Um, <laughs> why <Okay>. did, <laughs> why do you have an attitude? <laughs> Why didn't you go towards more private investment as an option? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And we did have offers of private investment. Um, we didn't need to. We got, we were able to secure that bank loan. Um, and I did mention this in my, if, if our landlord hadn't done the build out of our, of the facility we're in. So we own anything in the building that moves. He owns everything that doesn't. He put the hood in flooring, walls, lights, my land, and, and we pay that in rent. So my rent isn't cheap, but my loan, I have a very small loan. Yeah. Um, and because we were able to find that situation, we didn't have to do private investment. We did, there were, there were other buildings. We, oh, my dog, hold on. Um, there were other buildings that we would have, I think we would have had to go with some private investment oh. and it's nice to own your own company and not have to deal with it. So. Cool. Um, that your LFPP grant sounds timely and interesting, a local food hub development project. Is that a statewide thing? I mean, would like to yeah. learn more. Yeah. It's that one's a big one. It's federal. It's um, it's administered by the agricultural marketing service, which is a branch of USDA. Um, you could just Google it. Uh, they're yeah. big, big grants. They're not for the, not for the faint of heart. 
it's a lot of work and there are days when we kind of wish we hadn't done it. Um, it's, 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 I won't say, I mean, we're glad to do it and it's good work. Um, but it's a, it's a pain working, working with some of those programs is a big pain. You have to, and, and Matt worked for the state department, um, administering basically really big grants in, um, in developing countries. And, uh, I mean, he didn't like it, but he was good at it. And so, you know, we do have a competitive advantage in the whole grant, grant writing business. But again, it takes, sometimes that takes away from efforts that you could be putting into your business too. And that's why it's really important to sometimes not take the money. I've heard people say the best and the worst day of your life is when you get a grant. Um, Yeah, right. (laughs) So. (laughs) Except for that, that value added producer grant, I have to say, um, those are amazing. Those are, those are great. Uh, A couple of other, uh, what would you, what would you recommend to learn about grant writing? Um, it sounds like you've got it right in your back pocket with Matt, but. Um... Yeah, I mean, what I would say is start with one. I mean, everyone should look at these SARE Farmer Rancher grants. They're, they're national. Every region has their own. Um, we're, in this, we're in the North Central region, which would cover, I don't know if it's all the way to Indiana or what the North, North Central region covers. It's a really good little, way to kind of get your feet wet with grant writing and and know what deliverables are and making sure that you're reporting the way you need to report um accounting you know it's like a small accounting project so i would really say that those are those would be a really good first step they usually announce them in the late fall like december is usually when the call for proposals comes out so i just i'd I'd watch for those another one like i was talking about is this frontera foundation and you do have to be in the chicago ish area um and that's a private grant but i was just flipping through it um earlier this morning and that would be a good one for someone who isn't a professional grant writer to apply for it your other option and this is real and again i'm all about paying people for their talents as you can hire people to write those bigger grants for you. Yeah. Um, there's a gentleman named Jim Gage that writes BAPG grants. Um, he's out of Southeast Wisconsin. He's wonderful. He knows the systems. You pay him to do it and he deserves what he gets paid to write those grants. And so that's your other option is find, find someone to, to do it for you. Uh, and don't feel bad about that. That's fine. Uh, it reminds me of me and drywall. I cannot do drywall, but um, <laughs> find someone who can, right? <laughs> uh, this is related. I, I mean, what websites or resources do you scour for grants? I mean, how do you find like the one in Chicago you just mentioned and stuff? I mean, it's all word. I mean, for me, it's mostly word of mouth. Um, yeah. yeah. Boy, you just kind of have to. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know that a lot of Google searches are going to get you there. I think a lot of times it goes back to like Tara Johnson sends me grants when she sees something come across her desk that she thinks my extension agents are really good at sending me things that they think I'm so creating really good relationships with people. Mm -hmm. They're going to funnel those things to you. You don't have to, you don't have to kill yourself to find them. Just, just be a good friend and, Hang out with people. <laughs> um, yeah, booze comes in handy. Then I would imagine. Yes, right. <laughs> Does help when you when you make booze. Yeah. Any advice about financials for transitioning between generations farms? Is that something? Oh that's a yes. tough. That's a tough one. Would you recommend so, to aspiring farmers to take a training in financial literacy or business finances before going into business? Those two are kind of connected. Yeah. I think so, but I, I mean, I, I do think so. I mean, I wish I had done more, but I also think you can do all the training you want. I mean, how many, we all have them in our family, I'm sure. I have an MBA in my family who thinks that he's giving me advice all the time, but the guys never run a company. I mean, I, I struggle when people who've never, and that's, I love extension. I love all of our conservationist friends, but sometimes it can be really tough when someone's never done it themselves. Um, Yeah. And that's where it goes back to finding those people, whether it's, you know, retired business owners, people in your community Mm -hmm. that have done it and kind of been there. 
um, is probably more valuable even than a course sometimes. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think until you're in it and get into QuickBooks and that's what I was saying about the QuickBooks training. I was like, we did it. And I feel like that was like the worst one because it's just, everyone's so unique and different. That's really, that's tough. As far as transitions, farms, one generation to another, um, within a family, it can be really tough. Like what are the aunts and uncles? What are their expectations and all the cousins? It's, I would say though, that FSA loan I'm talking about can be a game changer. If you can come up with enough equity to get one of those low interest, um, low down payment loans, maybe you can just straight up buy a portion of the farm. Um, I, I am nervous for a lot of the young farmers I work with dairy farms where, um, one kid stayed behind. And to be honest, that kid deserves the farm. In my opinion, I don't think aunt Flo and aunt Jane deserve to get their piece of the farm. Um, but unfortunately fairness is this thing that we've equated to birthright instead of work. And so I've always felt like the, the kid who stays behind should get it. And, and I think the other people need to step back a little bit. And you do see a little bit of that um, transition of farms outside of families can also work, but, but that farmer has to be of the mindset where they're willing to transition the farm out of the family. People are really stuck in their ways. And that's, it's, it's almost never about the money. It's like cultural, right? We feel like mom and dad worked hard, so I deserve this farm instead of really mom and dad worked hard to make this farm and take care of this place while they had it. And we need to figure out how to continue to, I mean, the farms, it's terrible. I, I wish it, I don't have a good answer. Sorry. Oh, I think you you just touched on a very important range of issues that people have to address. There's no single solution. So I think you're right, right on top of it, you know, um, but yeah, fairness and what's fair. Um, I'm always curious about this. What do you do for childcare? <laughs> okay. Pre-COVID, my kids went to an in-home daycare. I, I, I pulled them out um, back in September when school started because we decided to keep our kindergartner at home and not send him to school because we wanted the grandparents to still stay. I am a, I, again, to each their own. I love my kids, but I am not, I am not meant to be home with my kids all day. And I can tell you that now more than ever. Um, time. I mean, I love my kids, but they, they also enjoy, like now they're in school again and it's really wonderful. Um, Childcare is really tough right now. My five-year-old's in all day and my three-year-old is there three days a week. And Matt and I just deal with the other two days. It's, it's been really, really stressful. Um, and to be honest with you, it hasn't done great things for my relationship with my kids, the COVID. Um, I'm really happy to have someone else help me out and people that they really love. So I'm, I'm yeah. a child care proponent. <laughs> Uh, hire it done when it needs to be. <laughs> hire it done, yeah, exactly. Uh, last question, and there's a couple more comments. A, 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 a small meat processing facilities are closing. How might a, good of, a group of farmers organize and run a processing plant for their chicken, ducks, hogs, et cetera? Is that something yes. you're... Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that you... Uh, my friend April Prussia... Um, Dorothy's Range Farm. She's down in Blanchardville. She's been working really hard on this problem. Um, depending on where, what state you're in, you're always going to have different regulations. I can speak to Wisconsin. Um, we have state inspected facilities. We have federal inspected facilities. I always think there's a place for cooperatives and then sometimes there's not a place for cooperatives. I don't know about, someone's got to be in it and someone's got to run that plant and someone's got to not also have a farm, in my opinion. I think that to think that a group of farmers can farm effectively and well and market and then also run a processing facility cooperatively, it's tough. I mean, I think you could go back and maybe read the history on Organic Valley and see how they managed to get where they're at. And I think cooperatively owned is beautiful. 
cooperatively run is a different story. I think that um, meat processing is a huge problem. I get calls on it several times a week. I'm not going to pretend it's not um, big. I just, if I had to run my business cooperatively with someone other than Matt, it, it gets complicated really quick. And I just think it's fine to own it. I think that you just need to really find it, someone who can run it. That would be my advice. Yeah. 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 And when uh, we had Ty Gustafson with the Story City Locker here in Iowa on yesterday and then similar kinds of questions and similar kinds of comments back as well. So that okay. I think every state has, has, has to deal with this issue of not having that processing available that's needed right now. Right. And I think mobile slaughter units are the most economical, humane way to, that we can deal with it. No one wants a slaughter plant in their backyard anymore. And so I think citing them in a community is going to be um, pretty much impossible. And so we need to really invest in these mobile units. It's better for the animal. It's, it's better for everyone. And then get some um, well-trained butchers in whole animal butchery back on the, back on the main street. I think and that's what Ty brought up yesterday is mobile processing as the, as yeah. the solution to some of the midsize lack of. I think that's right. it. There is one comment here, and we're about 1025. Uh, I love your humor. I love your attitude. It's refreshing. The dream crusher comment was great. Tara is great okay. at that. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm glad someone else knows Tara and knows the dream crushing. Um, <laughs> It is. It's really important. You just, you can't be surround. You can't surround yourself by cheerleaders all the time. Uh, or you get led down a road. That's not a good one. So yeah. 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 It's that, I think that's it for questions. Uh, um, Wendy okay. is part of this. And if Wendy, I'll look down at the bottom here and see, Oh, what is your employee? Last one. What is your employee employer relationship style? Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> so you can ask my employees, but we are, um, the one thing I really love about my employees is for the most part, um, I employ all adults, like older people, which is amazing. The high school students I do have are like spot on and awesome and they're great. But for the most part, I've gotten really lucky and people want to work for us. And so it tends to be, um, I have several farmers that, you know, over the winter, they work for us. Um, that we source from, and then people just kind of want to be a part of what we're doing. And so I end up getting older people who are, you know, I don't mind someone working a couple shifts a week. And the thing about me and Matt is we are like, we are so hands off. Like, that's why I like having adults. I want my employees to be able to make decisions and feel confident about those decisions. And so we're, we are not micromanagers. It probably bites me sometimes but I just, it's not my style. And so we are, we're real hands off, but we trust, we trust our employees to make good decisions. And I think, um, I think that's important. Um, excellent. I think I could tell that they would probably like working for you as well. So um, well, you can ask them. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that will wrap up our session this morning. I think there is a lot of good questions, a lot of entertaining uh, commentary, uh, uh, insightful. Um, somebody who's doing it is always better than somebody who's talking about doing it. Um, yeah. And so thank you. We're at 1028. One last question. Can you speak to into providing health insurance for employees on a farm? How much is an employer contribution? Is there any subsidi subsidizing of it? That's a big that's issue. It, health I, so that's, yes, I don't know. I don't know on farm as much. What I do know is that I'm doing my employees a disservice at this point if I offer them health insurance. How messed up is that? So the second I start offering my employees health insurance, they're going to have to pay a good chunk of money. And now they're not eligible to go through um, the marketplace. Oh. And so I've had that conversation with several of my full-time employees and we've made a decision together. Again, I was willing, um, but we've made that decision. We've done the research and we decided because we're not obligated to offer it, um, my employees are better off without me offering it. Oh, interesting. So you yeah. talk to them about it and we worked do, out yeah. a solution. Yeah, because I do, I have, I have full-time employees that have yeah. families and I want to make sure that they're taken yeah. care of. Yeah. 